Good morning, traders. This is Bruce at VeloxPro. If you can hear me and see my screen, can you just type yes in the questions? And we'll get started. All right. Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Um, today uh, is the last day of our um, uh, professional uh, webinar series. Uh, we've had a, a professional trader uh, each day this week uh, present, and uh, hope, hopefully uh, uh, this, this has been really good for you guys uh, to see uh, uh, how uh, other traders in a variety of different methodologies, uh, how they're using uh, order flow uh, within their, their trading, uh, and then how they, how they use uh, book map uh, within that uh, uh, environment. So uh, today we have uh, Daniel Scalak, and um, uh, he's an E-mini uh, S&P trader, uh, and uh, he's been trading for about six years. Uh, he's full-time now for a few years, and uh, a follower, a disciple of uh, Futures Trader 71, if you guys are familiar with him. Uh, he was on, uh, on, on uh, uh, Tuesday here, uh, and uh, I'll show you the recording of that as well, uh, where you can find all these recordings. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, he's uh, been... Uh, looking at a lot of the um, uh, well RT investor uh, and um, uh, looking at uh, uh, volume uh, profiles and looking at the book to understand the order flow within uh, his methodology of trading with the volume profiles. Okay, so uh, we'll get uh, get into it here in just a second. Uh, let me show you where the recordings are. You will need to uh, become a member here at uh, bookmap.com. Come into this area here. Uh, you can see where you can uh, register for um, uh, other webinars here as well. Uh, and then um, I'll have one up for next week here soon. Uh, and then uh, the recorded webinars here, just click on the recorded uh, webinar button. And, uh, and you can see the uh, one that we had from yesterday, Thursday, uh, with Jason Love. And uh, now click in the upper left-hand corner, and you'll get the playlist here okay, on that icon. And um, uh, you can see all the different um, uh, webinars that we had. So Monday, we had uh, Mete. Uh, then on Tuesday, we had uh, FT71. Uh, on Wednesday, we had uh, Ferran Font, uh, Ramental. And then we had Jason Love yesterday on Thursday. Okay. Okay. And if you want to give Bookmap a try, uh, this is where you can find it. It's under the pricing uh, tab at bookmap.com. And um, uh, let's see, you have the um, uh, free trial here for 14 days. Uh, and then there's the basic and advanced versions. You can see the price here. They are billed quarterly. Uh, and the big difference between the advanced and the basic are these add-ons and the ability to trade right from the chart. Okay, so uh, let me uh, read the disclaimer. Uh, trading futures and options on futures involves substantial risk of loss is not suitable for all investors. Past performance is not indicative of future results. More information at bookmap.com. I went over the free resources and you can reach out to us at support at veloxpro.com. So uh, other than that, let's, uh, let's turn it over to Daniel and uh, welcome. All right, thanks Bruce. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes. All right. Uh, thanks a lot and good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining me this morning. Uh, I recognize a lot of you from interacting in the S5 chat or on Skype or on Twitter. Uh, I'm very excited to have been asked to do this presentation for all my friends here. Uh, this is my first webinar, so take it easy on me, all right? It's the final day of this professional trader webinar series. Uh, organized by Bookmap, and uh, for this webinar, I thought about what I would want out of it uh, if I were in attendance. And for me, uh, a lot of blogs, a lot of tweets, and webinars will talk about uh, specific trades or trade setups and how to trade. Uh, but something that was really helpful for me was a conversation with a friend about how important the hours are when the market is closed and uh, how what happens in that time has a measurable effect on the decisions that we make once the market's open. Okay, so uh, many of you have seen this chart before, five stages of trader development. Uh, it's a lot like driving a car. Uh, stage one, you're 16 years old and you're like, I got this, 
right? You grab the wheel, and the instructor tells you to merge onto the highway, and you're like, oh, shoot. <laughs> and here's stage two, okay? Conscious competence. All of a sudden, you realize you have no idea what you're doing. Uh, and then a few weeks or months go by, and you realize not everybody on the road is targeting you to become the beneficiary of vehicular manslaughter. And that's a very special moment. That's when you say, wow, I can really just kind of protect myself slash watch my risk, and I should be all right. All right? So sometime later, uh, you realize you're starting to memorize the street names, and uh, you're getting confident you can get from point A to point B without putting anybody in real danger. And uh, I think that confidence is the key word here. Uh, and then you have stage five, autopilot. Now you can listen to Britney Spears at whatever volume you want while drinking your large Diet Coke and texting your boyfriend, and you're completely in control of your abilities to drive the family car without incident. So uh, let's, let's take a quick poll. I want to see uh, where you guys consider yourselves here. All right, let's see. So I'll leave this open for a couple of seconds while you guys think about that. We've got about half of the people voted here. I know it's it's hard. It's probably hard to understand if this is the first time you're seeing this. Um, but just to give you guys an idea of where you stand as as uh, compared to the other members of the audience here. Yeah, Daniel, so, can, you, uh, can you go over the descriptions again? Yeah, sure. So uh, stage one, unconscious incompetence. You don't know what you don't know. You're totally oblivious to your incompetence as it relates to the trading. Uh, stage two, conscious incompetence. You know that you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> uh, stage three is kind of the turn, I suppose. Uh, the moment that you start to understand that you, you can't predict the market, that nobody can predict the market. Uh, stage four, conscious competence. You start becoming more uh, consistent and able to control your emotion. And then stage five, uh, which hopefully some of you can tell me what that feels like because I'm not sure. That's the running on on uh, autopilot. All right, so uh, we'll close the poll here. And these are the poll results. Let's see. Can you guys see this right now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, a lot in the middle here, uh, a couple on the, on the edges. This is a perfect little histogram. Um, 32% stage three, 32% in stage four, a couple stage two. Um, so just to get an idea, thanks guys for uh, participating there. So let's uh, let's continue here. Who is this guy? Why should I listen to you? All right, and this is a, this is a fair question. Uh, like many of you, I do not come from a financial background. Uh, I decided to take on this masochistic venture of trading futures about six years ago. Uh, read books, took classes on Wall Street. I'm not going to name any names, but uh, what I really learned was what not to do. And that was a very painful, expensive start to this journey, as I'm sure many of you have experienced for yourselves. Uh, eventually, my uncle introduced me to this online community slash brokerage, uh, Stage 5 Trading, and specifically Futures Trader 71. And I was immediately impressed with his efforts to educate traders like myself without trying to sell me anything, uh, and explicitly so. So now the books I was reading were about psychology and risk and not uh, stochastics and trade setups with clever names. Uh, so I don't want to bore you with this whole bio thing. Uh, so fast forward, here we are today. If you're a struggling trader uh, trying to um, you know, have better consistency and struggling to make the turn. And I'm just like you, all right? I'm not driving a fancy car. My fridge isn't stocked with champagne. I'm absolutely honored to be included in this webinar series alongside these true professionals like Mete, Morad, Farhan, and Jason. But quite simply, I'm not in their class, all right? I'm here to show you uh, that this really can be done. Uh, you don't have to be a finance genius 
or a stats guru, although I'm sure it helps if you are. Uh, but I'm not here to, to try to teach you anything per se, but as a peer to bounce ideas back and forth off of. All right, so I'll show you what I do. You show me what you do. Let's narrow it down and progress together. So what are we doing here? Uh, the goal of this webinar is to show you kind of a day in the life of, uh, with the hopes that I may unconsciously just go over that little piece of information that makes it all click for you, uh, something you can use. Uh, like I mentioned before, I think it would be a disservice to you to just show you a trade or a plan in a trade uh, without explaining where it all comes from. Okay, so I'll go over my routine and homework quickly, uh, just leading up to the 9.30 a.m. cash open. Uh, I'll open a book map, we'll go through the morning, and then uh, I'll explain uh, what I think is the most important part of the process, and that's the weekly review uh, that I do on Saturday mornings. Uh, this is where I kind of uh, step outside myself and go over everything that I did for the week, uh, really harshly grading my own performance and emotions and miscues, uh, and, and have the opportunity here to make goals to measure myself against myself. Uh, in order to continue to move forward towards tighter and tighter consistency. So here's the plug for Power of Habit, uh, Charles Duhigg. If you guys have not read it, check it out. If you have read it, read it again. Uh, this book has been paramount to my sort of metamorphosis uh, and has taught me a lot about myself. So these first two steps constitute what I believe to be my keystone habit or uh, the one thing that I do that creates a domino effect to other areas of my life in a very positive manner. Uh, okay, so I make myself get up, chug a glass of water, make some coffee, uh, eat something light like a banana while my body slowly just wakes up and I get set up for the day. Um, I might read the newspaper here or just pick up a book for a little bit, um, but then I go jogging uh, in time to catch the sunrise and jog back. It's very romantic. Uh, this, I believe, makes me focus more throughout the day. Uh, I make better dietary decisions, I'm more patient, I'm in a better mood, and all of that's contagious. All right, so uh, after that, I usually have a little bit of time before 8.30 when I really sit down and uh, I start to, you know, just hang out with the family a little bit, uh, help out with my little guy and make my wife some coffee, just say hi. Okay, and then my, my day really begins at 8.30 a.m., and this is Eastern time, New York time. Uh, here, 8.30, I'm in the driver's seat, I'm focused, concise, and efficient, straight to the point with my observations of the overnight market and my plans for the day. And I'm done and prepared to trade by 9 a.m. Uh, when, as some of you know, uh, FT does his daily live trader bite. If you're not familiar with this, uh, he just does a 15 to 20 minute video on YouTube every day going over the prior session's expectations, what happened, economic releases, his hypotheses for the day. Um, I always learn something, and he'll often go off on a tangent about risk or trade management or psychology, and these are some serious gold nuggets. All right, that gives me about 10 minutes after that of just kind of silence and moments of breath and self-awareness before the madness that is the opening bill. And then it's game time. Uh, so we'll go through some of that quickly, and I'll show you how the trading day unfolds in bookmap. And then... Uh, at 4.15, the market's closed. I prepare everything I can for the next day, as well as a quick recap of the completed session. Uh, always re-watch that day's trader bite and then completely disengage, and that's really important to me. Uh, if, if I happen to hit my daily loss limit, which fortuitously is not too often, uh, or if I find that I wasn't aligned with the market for whatever reason and it's still bothering me, uh, I'll put my son to bed for the night and then come back to Bookmap and IRT and replay the session to try to gain some insight as to what went wrong. So I don't want to linger too long on this because I know everybody has their own layout that they like, and that's perfect. That's great. I just wanted to uh, quickly just give you an idea of what I'm looking at. I just try to keep things as clean and simple as possible. Uh, so this first monitor on the left, um, this is the stage five member chat rooms open on the top left. Below that is a little pop out called the real time trade analyzer from stage five, uh, which has actually been replaced this week with a theoretical average indicator in book map. Uh, we'll go through that. For more insight on that one, you can always look at uh, the professional webinar series video from Tuesday with Morad. 
Uh, that's the central topic of conversation there, and he explains why that's a key piece of information while campaigning around a position. All right, and then a pretty straightforward 15-minute candle chart with delta and volume uh, and the old trusty uh, ladder-style depth of market on the S5 platform itself. I don't really use this anymore. Uh, it's just a familiar and uh, easy way to take in a lot of information at a quick glance. And, of course, book map. Uh, this is my main and center screen, so I can really focus on it. Uh, I use two different CVDs. Um, cumulative volume delta indicators at the bottom there, uh, one for orders of 100 contracts or more, which I call large lap delta, and one for total delta. Uh, we can go over this in a bit more as we start the trade, but uh, this is an absolutely indispensable product in my opinion. And then my third screen, uh, the monitor on the right, I have a two tick Renko chart as well as my daily trade log and FT71's cash indices chart to see which sectors are moving as well as correlated markets and crude oils. Um, but this Renko chart I consider to be my second most important next to book map. It's just uh, another way to see uh, price action, consolidations, impulse moves, um, developing profile, just a, an overall view of the day so far. Okay. When I'm trading, this is the only thing on my desk other than my mouse and my keyboard. Uh, on the left side, you have economic releases, as well as a summary of the prior day's action and three general hypotheses based on uh, if we open in range, above range, and below the prior range. Uh, and this is all completed at the end of the prior session. So, excuse me, at 8.30, when I sit down, the first thing I do is take a look at the markets uh, at the bottom in the footnotes section and I update them. And this gives me an idea as to overall market sentiment. Is money moving into risk assets or into safety assets? Uh, is it mixed? Is it unchanged with nothing new to value in? Uh, then we have my trading goals for the week at the top right to keep me in check and remind me that each trade is part of a larger data set. All right, the first small paragraph in the overnight section is, uh, is a, a basically a quick overview of the footnotes markets. Um, just I want to know overall, uh, are the global markets overnight indicating an appetite for risk or flight to safety? Uh, the second um, paragraph there is just basically about what the ES has done overnight. And uh, we'll talk about this in the next slide, uh, followed by the two hypotheses for the day, which are derived from those. So this is my overnight chart, ES Globex session, a 15-minute candlestick chart. And I make it a point to always go through how we opened, where the overnight high, low, and point of control are, uh, the price action, the shape of the volume profile, whether either the high or the low appears weak, uh, with a sharp kurtosis to the histogram or uh, you know, a double top, double bottom. And, uh, and then finally the overnight volume relative to that time. Uh, I always have to add the time in because it might be a couple minutes different just depending on where I am for that morning. Uh, and the goal here is just to, to paint a picture so that when I do my review at the end of the week, I can picture this all in my head again. And here we go. Uh, this is what I mainly use the 15-minute chart for, an educated guess on a higher time frame of what's going to happen for the day. Okay, I was just talking about this with my friend Peter on Twitter. For the most part, one goes up, one goes down. And in its essence, that's very simple. One of them will likely play out and give me targets to shoot for. Uh, but the idea here is that after these are in writing, I don't have to quote-unquote think so much anymore. Uh, my goal is to identify which hypo is playing out as early on as, as possible uh, after the open and then just watch order flow and price action for narrowing down entries and exits. Uh, and this does two things. One, it eliminates an entire direction. So now I'm only looking short or I'm only looking long, no flipping, which immediately reduces risk for me. Secondly, if I lose a trade, it allows me to see where I went wrong. Either A, I identified the wrong hypo, B, I identified the right hypo but traded it poorly, or C, the hypo itself was wrong, okay? Uh, which then allows me to be able to just adjust my goals and uh, I can fix whatever issue it was. As long as I can define what the problem is, I can come up with a strategy to curb it. 
9 a.m. Trader Byte uh, every weekday. If you're not familiar with this and you want to check it out, go to YouTube and search Futures Trader 71. You know how the internet works. This is a two tick Renko chart for uh, February the 8th, last Wednesday. Uh, that's the trade I've chosen to recapitulate. So I'll bounce kind of back and forth between this and book map to show you uh, where we stand in relation to the other. Uh, and I've, I've already uh, integrated my notes from my daily trade log into book map. Uh, so you can kind of see where my head was at as the day developed. Uh, and like I said before, I usually do this just kind of in the corner of the screen in Excel, but I thought it would be more helpful to see both of these at the same time. So this is my book map screen. Uh, I have my custom notes column. Um, a lot of you see this in the stage five chat room each morning, uh, just kind of outlining uh, inter interesting prices, uh, prior low a day, prior value area high, prior close, um, you know, micro composite volume point of control for a certain range of time. Uh, and here we are at 9.28, two minutes before we open. The large lot delta we talked about, total delta, and these two will both reset right at 9.30, as you'll see. All right, so, uh, so let's kick it off. We'll see. We'll speed it up a little bit here. Yeah. All right, and here's the open. So obviously a ton of volume starts to come in, uh, and I like to keep my heat map at a pretty high contrast as you can tell. I just want to know where the big boys are playing. So immediately you see this driving behavior to the downside. I'm questioning, uh, the OS isn't in yet. I'm not sure that this can be the opening swing high, uh, but it looks like we might have an opening swing low, but I'm not sure. If we continue further, we might have an open test drive type of open. Okay, and this is all uh, market auction theory stuff. Speed it back up a little bit. You see these guys below all uh, starting to get aggressive here on the bid, and uh, you can you can confirm it with the liquidity over here. A couple thousand over here versus still below a thousand on the uh, on the offer. But they're not really they're not getting too aggressive. I kind of want to see these guys test, and I'm not I don't know what we're playing here, hypo one or hypo two yet. What direction I'm, I think we're going to go? So the OS is confirmed as this rotates down this was a higher area where sellers stepped in. So this is the opening swing high. So that's where I log this. Opening swing high, right here at the top. Opening swing low, right here at the bottom. Pretty straightforward. Now, I want to see what happens down here. And you see buyers start to pull a little bit of liquidity here. And sellers are still getting aggressive. Let me move this up a little bit for you. And as this is happening, as you would expect, delta is declining. And we're knocking on the door here at 82. You still see sellers on the bid, but they're unable to take that liquidity. Okay, so this is a possible sign for me that hypo two might be in play without an extension lower. Okay, so I'm I'm looking. Let me remind you, the second hypo here. We're looking for an open test down 81 half, and then that's basically my reversal level for the day. So we're still chopping around within the opening swing. And we get a retest here of the opening swing high, which basically just confirms that level. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, as we start to move down here, we see buyers start to pull. Uh, this is fake liquidity. So even though I'm thinking this might be my, my, my second hypothesis for the day. There's no reason here to get long. We have a higher low, uh, which might be an indication of that, but the deltas are still negative, uh, which again is to be expected off of that opening swing. And you see sellers start to step in here. And they start to move their liquidity down. And they're flashing back and forth, so we can't really put too much emphasis on that quite yet. But look at this, this is all, they start to move away as soon as price moves up here. And that's telling me that if we do move up, there's a good chance that they're just gonna step aside and let this thing go. So I'll move this a little bit quicker here. 
uh, I really want an extension of either the opening swing high or the opening swing low to really uh, call out a hypo for the day. You get a lot of volume right here on this push down, and these buyers stepped out of the way. So, like I said, no reason to get long here. I'm not seeing anything. But also no reason to really get in short because we haven't tested above the opening swing high. So just waiting and watching. Now we get an extension here to the downside. Uh, extending lows again. Hypo 2 is on the table. Okay. Now when this happens, uh, I start to place my targets. I want to get my targets out as soon as possible. Okay, and I added a target here, three ticks. I always uh, front run my targets by three ticks. And uh, this, was, this was a level that was called out. It's a 90 level uh, micro composite low volume node, which was called out by, uh, which was uh, in the trader byte from that morning. So that brought that to my attention and fits in between uh, my first and second target here. So as this starts to go, you'll see me adding targets immediately. And uh, so I want to be, uh, like Bruce says a lot of times, this is a fee full market, first in, first out. So I want to get in line as early on as possible. Let's see if I can move this easier when it's, if it's stopped. So as you can see above, all these targets start to go in. Boom, 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 boom. And I don't have anything on. Okay, so I have to be careful. If price starts to move, if there's a news event, I have to cancel these really quickly if I don't have anything on. But I just want to be uh, in front of the train here. And it, it also uh, makes me want to get another contract on and keeps me a little bit aggressive uh, while I'm in the middle of the trade. So here we go. Hypo 2 is on, which means I'm no longer looking for shorts. I'm only looking for longs, even though we didn't really get an extension that I was looking for. Let's fast forward this a little bit here. So if we could get an extension here down to uh, the close of this gap zone, then I would be looking to the order flow to add one on uh, to start this campaign. Um, but we didn't get that test down. So instead I'm looking for a test higher above the opening, op uh, sorry, the open swing high, and then back to around the middle of, uh, of the range for the day. So here we go. All of a sudden, I'm saying, be careful with this, this hypo too. Uh, be careful with longs because I've got clean blue tips here, which is basically uh, saying that buyers are not aggressive. Uh, we're not. They're basically exhausted in this area as far as I can see. And I'm looking at the large lot tracker. If you pause it here, look at these large lots. I just keep this on default, okay? But look, there's, there's a large lot at least at every single one of these uh, offers and then only a couple on the bid. And I just want to see these relative to these. Um, it doesn't really um, bother me what the settings are at. Let's move a little quicker. So you start to see a little bit of volume come in, but this isn't really telling of anything. A lot of this is just noise until we get outside of this opening swing. So now I see this 84 half level is uh, starting to add. They want to be short. So this looks real to me. These guys are coming up. Look, look how bright white this is at 84 half with 1400 contracts all of a sudden. And then as soon as it's tested, these guys pull. All right, and that tells me that this is even this is fake liquidity, and even I mean maybe some of them, some of them still want to get short, but for the most part, all this is pulled. So that's another indication that longs are still in play here. We still have the delta divergence, so I'm reminding myself just be cautious. Don't get too aggressive quite yet. And then we see extension to the high side. And all these sellers, look at this. I mean, these are buyers are still aggressive up here, and nothing. And uh, you know, these guys still pull. Everybody on the offer so far has been pulling here, here, here. So I know that most of this anyway is going to step aside for my long. Uh, you do see sellers start to step in a little bit and push, 
buyers start to move away too, again, a lot of this is just noise, but I'm stocking longs, okay, around the mid, which is this 83 level. And so I want to slow this down as it happens so you can kind of see why I entered at this level. So I'm looking for a long here, but what I'm really looking for, let me pause this, I know that I can, I can lean against this zipper back here. All right, this area of consolidation, I know that there's at least some interest here. So if I want to get in here at this 83 level, which is the mid, then I know I can put my stop basically down where these sellers started to be exhausted. So at 82, I'm wrong, which is, which is only a four tick stop. But I mean, I'm going to let it run a little bit more than that. I like to use a six to eight tick stop at least. Um, but I know I have this that'll back me up, and then there's another one back here that can back me up. So I've got plenty to lean on here for a long. And now as price comes down to this 83 level, buyers are pulling still. So there's, there's still no reason for me to get in long. Okay, all I need is a sign. I want some sort of sign from the buyers. And there we go. Boom, boom, boom. As soon as they, they jump in here and start to become aggressive, that's all I need. It's one little sign around my area, and I can get in long. Okay, now you'll notice I don't put a stop in right away. And that's because I want to add on down here. I want this to come and test this zipper uh, so that I can get another one in long around, I don't know, 82, 81 half when it starts to turn back around or when I see more aggressive buying start to move up. And uh, from there, I'll have two on and I'll be able to scale something out. Okay. But uh, unfortunately, slash fortunately, uh, it didn't go against me very much. So I, I was only able to get well, one on here. So I'm still looking to add. Move this a little bit quicker again. But there you go. I'll go ahead and put my stop in. And uh, I would have loved to add here where this has been consolidating above the mid, moves up, comes down, but this just happened too fast for me. We get a little bit of, uh, of a push here. And we know that all this was fake from before. So we know that if this goes up, it's going to push right through. And uh, so I, I put in my notes that we have a small collision here at 84 half, but it looks for the most part like they stepped, they stepped aside. But it might be an area uh, just to, to keep in the back of my mind, which is why I write it down anyways. So we get this extension. And this is basically wasted on me, okay, because I wasn't able to get that second contract on to be able to scale out ahead of these new highs. Okay, um, so when this starts to pull back, I still want to add my second on long, but this is my theoretical average here. I was not able to help that out at all. So I want to reduce my risk at least somehow. So I put this stop behind this lower low. Uh, we made new highs. So we have a new mid somewhere around 83.75 or so. And uh, I'm waiting for a pullback, but I'm still, I'm wrong. If this gets down here and it's able to make new lows, I'm wrong anyway. That's fine with me. Uh, trade didn't work out. Uh, same way as if this went straight up and took out my target with only one contract on. That's fine. All right? I, didn't, I didn't trade it perfectly, but just missed my, my opportunity here. So then we see this chop uh, on low volume, and it's Wednesday, so I have to be careful. We've got crude oil inventories coming out at 1030. All right? And this is the only time that I will trade my P&L because I can't get a second one on. Uh, we, we're five minutes until crude oil inventories come out, so I'm not going to add another one on. So if this comes down and tags the mid, that's kind of a bummer because I, I'm not going to add on there, but it might just continue in my direction. You see some volume coming out to the downside. It's possible that you know I could get stopped out of this. But right before the numbers come out, I'm going to move my stop to break even because uh, as you guys have seen with crude oil inventories, I mean, this can, this can be a mover. If this thing is going to move to 83, it's going to move to 82 half, all right? I'm going to be stopped. So I want to see a reaction, what happens after the inventories come out. And there's not much. I mean, we moved five ticks in two minutes here, even though crude is going crazy and just kind of fluctuating. Um, so I moved my stop back because I don't want to trade this P&L. So still back behind the swing low on clean green tips here. Two ticks from the IBH. Uh, we've got fake liquidity here. They pulled each time. Got another push down here, so this might be my opportunity. Let's see if I can slow it down again here for you. 
So there it is. That's all I needed. That's all I needed to see. We see a push down here. We've got quickly a, a higher low. And it starts to push, and I see buyers, boom, 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 just maybe flash signs that they might be aggressive at coming back down here. And that's all I need. This is an area of importance for me that I might want to get long, and that's all I need is one little indication that I've got some protection. As soon as I see that, I want in. And I always I split these two uh, stops. Okay. So I've got what I call my aggressive stop and my conservative stop, which is uh, kind of uh, counterintuitive because my aggressive stop actually um, saves me money if I get stopped on it. My conservative stop is riskier, but that's just what I call it. So uh, I keep one there. This other stop is in this area, not because it's a certain amount of ticks or anything, but because it is below this zipper, this exhaustion again. Okay, so if I get stopped out on that, I might still have a chance with protection here to continue in the right direction, even though I've, I've worsened my theoretical average here uh, by a tick and a half until I can get a scale out. I'll speed back up now that we're in. Now, again, I mean, look at this delta. We're still negative delta down here. And uh, so this is still, I mean... This isn't a, an extremely confident trade. I'm just taking the trade that I planned out for the hypo to see if it works. Now, uh, we've got a movement up, so I want to move my aggressive stop. Let me explain what happened here. I move my aggressive stop to new swing lows here. Okay, I want to kind of I kind of squeeze this with one aggressive stop, and uh, I let my other one fly at least until I can get a scale out and uh, I can improve this theoretical average. So what I did here was I moved my conservative scale to become more aggressive, and uh, I meant to move my aggressive scale. So that is a dome error, which I need to log in my book, but that's why it looks kind of funny here. But basically, I just moved this up two ticks, and this one remained. So we'll speed it up a little bit more again here. And we already know back here that this liquidity is fake, so I'm expecting a flush if this comes through. And that's perfect. And it takes me out pretty much immediately. I mean, that's 16 times speed, but uh, I didn't have to worry about if it comes up and, and uh, maybe takes 81 contracts out of my target level, I will consider moving uh, my target down a tick uh, if it starts to rotate back down, or two ticks even. Um, I, I give myself those two ticks uh, to try to get a scale out and add another one on later on. But uh, for this one, we got to push through, and it looks like we had shorts trapped here and just flushed the stop run. So uh, that one was convenient. Uh, so here you go. You see the theoretical average just get crushed here, and I love seeing that, man. It just pops all the way down here. So this is saying that my zero line is 79 half, as you see here. So for me to lose money on this trade, price has to come down below this level. And my stop, my last contract is all the way up here. So I know at least I'm making some money on this trade. And this is still a very aggressive stop. Okay, so I'm looking to add on again. And as we move higher, you know, again, if it takes this target, great. Uh, if it doesn't, great. Because then it will come down and I might have another opportunity to add on and keep this going. Because it's so much easier to add on than it is to find another clean entry. Because I'm not, I don't have as much risk. I'm, I've, my risk is eliminated here. I'm making money on this trade. So now that I'm, I'm in the black, I want to push it and push it and push it and push it as much as possible. And just be relentless with my additions. All right, so this comes down. Now I'm looking at where do I want to add next, okay? And that level for me is this prior low of day. Okay, so I have prior low of day. The new mid is down here. It hasn't been tested yet. It's a little bit below. I think it might be right here around 84.75 or so. And we can check that out. Let's see here. Uh, so here we go, coming back down. Uh, the mid is right here. So, yeah. 84 or 75, three ticks off of this 85 half that it comes down to. 
Um, so you've got that confluence. You've got confluence. The opening swing high is a big uh, rejection or support area. Uh, prior low of day, we're already back into the prior range. I'm expecting buyers to protect here. But what I did is I waited. I was too uh, complacent here. And I waited for this to come down, and I wanted it to touch it and see what happened there, looking for an area to get long. But I didn't see a reason to enter. And uh, this was my opportunity. It came down. We got a little bit of rejection. I've got plenty of space here. I can, I can, there's so many things here to lean on for me to add on to. But look at what happens here. We start moving sideways, and uh, we're almost around 11 o'clock. It starts to slow down a little bit, but we're moving sideways. We're barely even moving the, uh, the bid and the ask. And these guys are just loading up. Buyers are, you see these algos going off on the buy side. And this guy steps in. He wants to get all of these long. And this is like one and two contracts at a time, four, 12. And uh, you just, this was, this caught my eye. And uh, so a breakout of this area to the high side should be another addition, even if I miss this, this come down. And, you know, there's really nothing here, like I said, for me to add on to without it testing and seeing what happens down here. But uh, a breakout of this to the upside should be another indication because then I can just put my aggressive stop right below here as soon as I see that and move it up a little bit. So this guy moves down a little bit. He's st still seeing volume on the high side. Come down and test it, chopping within four ticks. I mean, this is more noise. But there you go. Here comes. You have a move to the high side. There it is. I would put my entry right there at 87 quarter. That's what I should have done in retrospect. Uh, but instead, I'm being too complacent because I'm already in the money for this day. So as that happens, it takes off. We see a small pullback there. I want to see what happens at this level. You know, if this bounces down, uh, this MCV puck level, and they moved away. So I know I'm pretty solid there. And, uh, and that's it. Unfortunately, that's it for me because I can't continue to add on because I missed these additions. Uh, if, this, if this were to continue, I mean, I've got this other one up here. Right after that, we've got a couple more opportunities throughout the day to add on and come down. Um, but uh, there's a very, very big difference for me between uh, an area to add and an area to enter. Um, and that's, that's completely based on risk. So let's uh, move back here to this slide. So after that, uh, that's it for me for the morning. I don't trade so well in the afternoon, so I basically try not to unless I'm already I'm still in a trade or you know nothing's really happened and something new comes about. Um, in that case, I might make uh, new hypotheses for the afternoon session. I'll just pause it where it is and uh, you know try to do the exact same thing from the morning. Um, so the RTH session is complete. We're done for the day. Uh, just need to prepare the next day's homework sheet with a review of this day's action. So I print this out. That's why I like the background in white. Um, unemployment calendar for the next day. Uh, are we in balance or are we in price discovery mode? Key areas to look for. Uh, we started in an open auction out of range, and that turned into a normal variation day, just to keep in the back of my mind. And then just a quick review. We opened with driving force to the downside, uh, push to the half gap. Uh, the OS, we slowed down a little bit, so the driving force slowed down, turned into an open auction. Uh, the initial test was lower, uh, but they couldn't continue the selling pressure, and we saw buyers take control to new highs, 85 here. As soon as we hit those new highs, like this is all one move. This is from lows to highs. So that gives this mid uh, a little bit more conviction for me. Uh, the, the developing volume point of control is above it. That helps out to give it a little bit more conviction. And we've already tested lower. So I'm expecting this to be the impulse move. I'm trading this move. All right. And, you know, hypothetically, theoretically, with another contract on there. Um, so basically, here you go. We saw a textbook support at the prior low of day, unable to get on. Uh, and then once we were above that, found support twice at the initial balance high, the first hour's high of the day. That's this orange line. Okay, and uh, shifted up to the 88 acceptance area and created a weak high into the close. You can see how we just dropped off on volume. You would expect that to kind of soften up. 
in the closing swing, barely came off the new highs. Uh, we closed right on top of the, the developing or the actual uh, volume point of control for the session. Uh, and I'm expecting this to resolve itself higher overnight. Daily VPOC movement, despite holding in the 88 area, which is this little pink line here for most of the day, which this looks like a shorter amount of time than this, but it's actually not. These, these uh, white and gray painted bars are 30 minute intervals. So uh, this is two hours here, two and a half hours, and then you see in here, I mean these, these four two tick Renko candles held for an entire 30 minutes. This can get really boring here, especially if you're waiting for something to happen. Um, so this is actually uh, quite a bit of time, even though it looks like a shorter amount. Um, expecting new uh, all-time highs in the next few days, uh, which did come to fruition. Uh, and then my three hypotheses for the next day. If we open up right where we are, open, chop, test lower, find buyers, new all-time highs. Gap up, responsive into the range, uh, testing this prior VPOC, prior close, prior MC volume point control here, and find buyers, new all-time highs. Gap down, responsive into the range, find sellers around uh, this level, this HVN here at the bottom, to continue lower. All right, I imagine if it's going to gap down, there's a reason to gap down, some sort of news event or something, and we're going to test higher and, and, and continue that move. Uh, now I want to show you another indispensable tool that I use for my weekend review, and this is the Stage 5 Historical Trade Analyzer. Let me pull this up so you guys can see this here. So this is what it looks like, um, and this thing, this thing's awesome. Uh, this is what I use for my weekly report card, basically. Uh, win percentages, loss percentages, MFE, MAE. This was the week of February 6th through the 10th. So let's analyze it. Six trades. That's all I did. Okay. Uh, not very active, but I'm okay with that. I felt as though I took the opportunities that showed up, um, but we just aren't seeing the volatility and range that justify four or five trades a day for me right now. Uh, the main thing that I took away from this was a hesitance or lack of aggression. When, uh, as you've probably <laughs> uh, found the tone throughout this entire video so far, uh, so I'm upset that all of these these winners are max quantity of one contract. I need to get a second one on. One, one, one. Sure, my this loss, I got two on there. All right, but uh, so that that's important to me to not stay complacent after you get you start winning. Okay, and so one way to define that is by using this. Okay, I can see that here, and I can use this max position quantity to set up a goal for the next week. Okay, so say, uh, for example, my goal might be I want to see no more than one winning trade with only one contract max position. Okay, for example, anyway. Okay, uh, but no, this was a great week for me. Uh, I hit all my trading goals, um, and. Uh, you know, this, this historical trade analyzer, this can be used uh, for so many things. This thing is incredible. You can, we can go back to the beginning of my relationship with stage five up until today and see how my tick expectancy has progressed or uh, what hour of the day I trade best during or what day of the week for that matter, uh, which is always interesting, especially um, like Jason Love pointed out yesterday, if you start to see um, habits forming that maybe every other Wednesday and Thursday happen to be lost days or something like that. Okay, so uh, you know this is just another product that Stage Five puts out that it really uh, enhances my ability to progress. And then uh, my favorite time of the week, man, Saturday review. Nothing like a little bit of quiet time to myself. Uh, just taking my time, go through each day, how it was setting up overnight, whether or not the global sentiment was towards risk and it produced a bullish day, uh, how I traded, where I did well, what I missed, uh, and I take detailed notes with thoughts and ideas for following the week's goals and uh, you know, just try to sort of relive the trading day. So although this was a quote-unquote successful trade, there was so much more here that uh, I could have done better, and it's really important for me uh, to point that out to myself. 
and this whole uh, going through the whole week takes about two hours or so. Uh, but as you can see, I just I just mark up the chart. You know, only able to get one on. Shame that I wasted this move up. I got to get aggressive with the second contract. Came down, sure, and nothing to write here. You know, who cares? No big deal. Great, it moved up and took your target. Who cares? Uh, no retest of the prior high of day. We got within one tick, but stay aggressive, man. Look at all this. You've got this zipper to lean on. You've got the prior high of day, the mid, the view app, the opening swing high. There's so much here, man. I had to get that on. Uh, and then you have a double top stack, and that's after I'm already out. So I'm unable to capitalize on that opportunity. It comes back, IBH. This is a perfect opportunity to add on long again. Scale out ahead of this. Okay, it continues to turn sideways. If I still have something on, great. I close at the end of the day. I close at 4, 14, and 45 seconds. All right, so I know that, you know, this huge delta divergence all day long was in the back of my mind, and that's what uh, made me a little bit more cautious about adding on to this move. And uh, especially, like, you see interesting things here, like this huge delta um, bearish candle on the close here and the buyers absorbed so just pointing out certain things um, but you know that's the idea so uh, some things that I want to leave you guys with uh, which have really helped me along the way uh, kind of aha moments right uh, minimizing risk being more important than maximizing reward um, especially with the first uh, first two contracts you're getting on. Scaling in and out, that kind of speaks to that. Okay, trading the market, not my P&L. Uh, I heard that uh, dozens of times before I actually understood it. And uh, let's see, each trade being part of a data set. And uh, like I said before, this uh, influences my emotion or lack thereof, uh, knowing that this, this trade is just is just one. I have to put it on. Uh, just like my hypo says, and that's it. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. We'll figure it out later. Uh, grading trades, tick expectancy, a huge way to, I mean, this grading, the idea of grading trades and uh, being able to make them relative to one another was uh, key. Following a routine, habit forming, uh, went through that, deliberate practice, you guys all know. Uh, asking questions, this is huge, right? Uh, the S5 chat room, this is great because I can't see any of your faces when I ask a stupid question. And I can ask that same stupid question every single day, and even if 299 of you are rolling your eyes, one person's gonna answer me that question, and that's all I need. I'm not embarrassed to ask anything. Somebody's gonna help me out, it's great. AMAs, always ask a question. Uh, I make it a point every single week. Uh, Morad does a public AMA uh, two times a month, every other week and a private one for the stage five members every other week. So we have four a month, one a week. And this guy is basically saying, I will answer anything you ask me. There's something that I need to know, right? I mean, I, it's just, I have to, I have to figure out a question to ask him. I think this past week there were like six questions or something. Let's load this guy up, man. Make his brain hurt. Um, books. I mean, we could talk about books for days. Um, Three of my favorites. Uh, I mean, you guys tweet me out what what you guys like, what your books are, your favorite books. Uh, minimizing emotion, emotional verbiage, and this this part comes back to the daily trade log, right? So I can uh, control F, find and replace throughout my entire daily trade log. I can just search expletives and find out where I was upset and why why and how that affected the, uh, what I did in the market and maybe affected the next trade uh, one way or the other, okay? So even if I have a successful trade after that, is that really truly a successful trade or um, is it uh, giving me, you know, reason to uh, emphasize my bad um, habits, right? Uh, learning to trust my in-trade self. This is a huge one. This, um, especially as far as campaigning goes, to be able to add and take off contracts while you're in a trade. This has a lot to do with emotion and knowing that you're a different person once you're inside a trade than when you put the trade on. Uh, I think we could do a whole other webinar about that. This is this is a really important topic for me. And then uh, encouragement and help from the Stage Five community. You guys rock. Uh, lastly, challenging myself to step outside of my comfort zone. I think that can be said for 
anything in life, really, right? So, uh, speaking of challenging yourself, let's. I'm gonna I'm gonna lay down a challenge. All right, I want you guys to write down one thing at which you think you should be better, or of which you think you should have better knowledge. Okay, like Excel formulae or uh, reading order flow, um, maybe something like over trading or becoming complacent during or after a winning trade. Okay, tweet it to me. I'll do the same, and let's set up a plan and take the first step next week to conquering that. All right, let's get a discourse going. All right. Uh, also, I'd love to hear what you guys did before you became traders, because that's always interesting to see how kind of left brain, right brain nuances carry over. Uh, so tweet those to me also. Uh, maybe let's set up a category like um, hashtag when I was sane or something <laughs> so uh, you can see them all in one place. Or don't. Whatever. <laughs> Bruce, uh, what do you got, man? Okay. Now, uh, uh, lots of questions here. So I've been answering a lot along the way here. Um, let me input your Great. Uh, Twitter uh, link there. Okay, uh, so that's in the chat for everybody. Okay, and all right, we'll just start from the top here. Um, let's see, uh, any other contact info do you want to uh, put in, uh, Daniel? Uh, no, that's my main one. Uh, if you want to reach me, my email is danielscalak at gmail.com. If you want to hit me up on email, that's great too. Uh, like I said, man, I'm always open for conversation. Okay. And uh, let's see here. Uh, yep, yeah, right off the bat here, Chris was asking about, uh, so you've been with FT for six years, uh, and he's asking about your profitability, and uh, uh, maybe you have a little bit of background on that, like... Um, uh, how long it took you, or uh, a little bit more of your journey on that? Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, I've been trading futures for six years, but I've been with uh, Stage 5 and FT for about three. And uh, that was basically from scratch. That was, uh, you know, those first three years of trading futures, I just chalked that up to uh, learning something that was important that I don't do. <laughs> and uh, so... Starting from scratch, not knowing anything about uh, volume profiling or market auction theory, that's where I was three years ago. And up to this day, uh, I can say that I'm in stage three of that, that eureka moment. I'm, I'm still turning the wheel around the turn. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm profitable, but I'm not profitable enough really to use this account to, uh, to live off of. Um, I couldn't, uh, you know, the the money that I make isn't isn't quite good enough to to, to just, you know, uh, have my broker send me checks every month, um, and uh, so I try not to touch that account anyways. But uh, for the most part, I'm just I just try to keep my head above water, and uh, as long as I, I I can keep an overall tick expectancy of three ticks per trade. Uh, that's when I know I'm doing really well. And for the most part, I fluctuate around that. I go from uh, anywhere to, you know, one to four. You know, that was a great week. That was nine and change. And uh, uh, you know when, it, when, a, when a week like that happens, watch out for the next week because it's going to bite you in the butt. And, and that is what happened to me this week. And uh, I knew that going in. I said I have to be cautious. That was one of my goals was that, you know, be cautious because, you know, after you have a great week like this, you know, next week we'll turn around and, and, and teach you something. Uh, but the other problem with that was one of my goals was to become more aggressive. So uh, counteract those two, and I was more aggressive, uh, but it didn't benefit me this week. Uh, but all in all, over, you know, six, six trades is a very small data set. So uh, over the course of the year, I want to be, I want to have a plus three tick expectancy per trade. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Um, some questions about your uh, dot settings. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's pull that up. So uh, this is something. All this 
uh, is something that I change constantly. I mean, you guys saw me moving this around. I don't like to keep this on auto because I want to see what's above and what's below, and I might want to zoom in to this level and see what's happening here or, or tighten it up and, and look back at you know, what happened back here. So I'm constantly changing the scale of, of the heat map. Uh, I, I, I also constantly change the size of the volume dots. Uh, the transparency, the pie display, the rest of these, I don't touch. I like to leave this on one because I want to see what's happening on those tips. I want to see the algos computing. And uh, the dot size is something that I'll change just using my eye. Uh, you know, I want to see at the beginning of the day, I don't want the volume dots to be too big, again, because I want to see these algos going off. Uh, so I, I tend to reduce this as we get closer to the middle of the day. Sorry, other way around. Increase this as it gets towards the middle of the day so that uh, the dots become more visible and more consistent with what I saw at the, the open where you see those huge dots as well. Okay, uh, let's see. Do you look at other markets in Bookmap as well? Other than the no. ES? Okay. No, I don't. Um, I know a lot of traders like to you know, look at crude oil or um, NASDAQ or the Dow or whatever and try to find, uh, you know, find an opportunity at, at every moment. But, uh, and this is just personal preference, I'm trying as hard as I can to learn this market and I don't want any of that to take away from that. Even if I do find uh, another opportunity in another market, I feel like that's inhibiting my learning of this market in some form of a, or another. That's just personal preference. Okay, uh, let's see here. Uh, John is asking about uh, how um, how does price action uh, factor in your strategy? And John, I'm a, I'm a little confused on that. If you can elaborate a, a bit, um, I, I mean, Daniel, in my mind, you've been you've been showing nothing but order flow and price action here. Yes, but I do uh, I do use price action for sure, uh, um, and specifically. Uh, this two tick Renko chart uh, like we talked about. So um, <clears throat> I'm using the price action for these levels uh, and let's pull back these hypos for the day. Okay, so this is all based on price action where these levels come from and uh, so when it comes down to this 81 level I'm interested, this tells me that hypo 2 is likely on, that this particular hypo is what I'm going to trade for the day. Right or wrong, that's what I'm trading. And uh, so the mid is, uh, is, is important to me. I want to see the price action here. And I use the order flow for the entry uh, to just kind of narrow it down on as minuscule level as I can to make sure. I mean, if this would have flushed through, uh, we saw it begin to flush. And you saw buyers start to pull when uh, I was looking for this level. But as soon as they got aggressive, that told me that we do have a little bit of, of help here. So, I mean, that, the, the, the IBH, the, all these levels that I'm, I'm expecting to hold the prior high a day, once we get into the prior range, I'm expecting buyers to protect, uh, things like that. And these zippers, you see these painted zipper bars, too. That's just something that points out to me that there was consolidation here. So if it comes down to retest this, that's another likely area that I can just put a stop back here and should be good. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Okay, so uh, Chris is asking if uh, your hypos differ uh, from more ads, uh, then, then uh, how, how do you adjust and, and do you adjust and, or just stick to yours? No, I, uh, I do stick to mine. I will add things if I see something on the, tr on the trader bite, like today he, he mentioned a uh, 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 micro composite uh, low volume node that was happening at 90 that I overlooked in Let's see, let's go back here. So this is what he's talking about, I think. Is this 90? No, 90 here. So I think he's looking at just these three days for a micro composite, and he, he put a uh, volume profile around these three days, and that uh, point of control was at 90, and that's something that I didn't see here because I'm taking in, if I'm taking into account these three, I'm also including these three. Uh, because we, we have volume that traded there. Uh, and so that's the one I was looking at. I wasn't expecting to, uh, that is one I think that I was targeting here, 91.75 or so, but. Uh, 
So if I see something like that, I'll add it in. Um, and my, my hypos do often um, differ from his. And a lot of times they'll be reversed. I'll have, uh, you know, his hypo one will be a bullish day and his hypo two will be for a bearish day. Uh, but he also takes into account a lot more than I'm taking into account. Mine, I think, is much simpler uh, and mostly because of his knowledge base just being much more so than mine. Uh, so he might say, you know, this is going to happen and then after we get down to 76, it's going to pull up for the rest of the day. Uh, so both of them will turn out to be bullish days maybe at the end of the day, something like that. But um, this is just a, a basic, um, I want, this is, this is based on the overnight market telling me that we are, uh, we have a sentiment towards safety. Okay, so that tells me I think we're probably going to continue that unless for some reason we have, uh, say, this market pulled all the way down. This is also something that, that was uh, taken into consideration that this being a bearish hypo one was that the day before we had a huge move down, we had a pullback, and we almost got the continuation, but we ran out of time. So <clears throat> something else that I'm thinking about is we might continue that move down today. And that's why this is the more likely hypo, uh, in my opinion. Okay, we've got a, a really good question here that I'm, I'm very curious about myself, um, uh, Daniel, uh, from, from Jeffrey. Uh, uh, Daniel, uh, were you as organized in your former life? If not, how, do you get, how did you get on this track? That is a good question. Um, I would say, um, man, that's tough. I would say partially. Um, I think that the discipline of uh, working at a three Michelin star restaurant and the uh, perfection that's demanded at every second uh, had something to do with that. And uh, that discipline is a key word. Uh, being able to follow the hypos and not get emotional about losing a trade or um, uh, that's tough, man. I mean, before before that, I would say it it came in in uh, it showed itself a little bit here and there, but no, I, not not particularly. I mean, I think that there's a little bit of um, kind of improv that is taken into consideration as well. Uh, you know, it's the discretionary part. So I don't know if I answered that completely or not, but I guess my answer is sort of. Okay. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Franklin is asking, uh, for someone who is new to Stage 5 and getting... Uh, who's getting trouble or having trouble understanding the auction after watching the webinars, uh, what would you suggest? Um, I would suggest uh, replaying uh, the market, actually. If you want to understand the auction, uh, obviously these, these volume profiles are a huge help. But, uh, and of course, this is a static screen. I can't show you this. But if you say, uh, I think more I mentioned this a couple days ago, if you take, say, 20 days worth of data and replay them at super high speed and, and just watch where they go, uh, you know, it really is something that attracts, you know, these, these you'll watch it. Let's see, we, we started in this day, um, you know, chopping around here, it formed this high volume profile in this balance area. The next day we moved down and tested lower and it formed this area. Okay, so now within these two days, we have, uh, it would look a little bit shallower than this, but you have a low volume node here. So now this day we start in the prior uh, high volume area and we move down and we test this low volume node to see if, you know, our buyers really going to protect and they think that the uh, structure of the market pricing is efficient here again. And they uh, come back up and they say, nope, we're going to, you know, go back and retest this area and shop around. And we found acceptance there. And that's what happened. So, uh, you know, really, really just replaying the investor RT data was something for me that helps uh, with the market auction specifically. Okay. No, I mean, it, it, it's just excellent to see how um, 
uh, prepared and organized you, you are and, and you have your bigger plan uh, and just a, such a nice integration of the order flow and Bookmap is that tool that you're using to view that order flow uh, within your bigger plan uh, and it's giving you the answers you, or the, you know what you're looking for uh, and you're just waiting. Uh, really, really nice. Really nice, Daniel. Thanks. Uh, let's see here. Um, uh, just a lot of technical questions here. Uh, what are you using to write your hypos uh, and the charting, the homework? Um, what kind of uh, uh, software are you using for the um, uh, Renko? And, and um, uh, I know you're using R RT and Investor. Um, or investor RT for the um, uh, profiling. Uh, any, anything uh, you want to elaborate on? Yep, that's right. Uh, I use investor RT for the volume profiling, the Renko chart, the overnight chart, and uh, that uh, FT71's cash indices chart. Um, and I also look at uh, a daily chart at the end of the day to just get a you know a broader spectrum of where we are. Uh, but that's all investor RT. Okay. For my homework and uh, statistical studies, I use classic Microsoft Office, man. Um, Microsoft Word is what I put my homework in. I just put it on a landscape mode so I can uh, have it in that that style of organization. And uh, the, the, the hypos, the little charts themselves, I create in uh, Excel and I just copy and paste them right back into uh, the homework file so that I can just have one printed 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper right in front of me with all the information I need to know to reduce the thinking. Okay, and uh, let's see here. Uh, one, uh, someone's asking about uh, uh, your relationship. Are you an employee with S5 or uh, independent trader? Nope, independent trader. I am a client of Stage 5. They are my broker. That's it. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, just a few more questions and then uh, we'll wrap it up here. Uh, yeah, sure. One by uh, uh, Otto uh, is asking about... Um, uh, what are some of the things you use to uh, keep your goals uh, and not get discouraged and, and to quit? Um, well, one way is uh, just basically adjusting my goals. So if uh, one week, for example, I have a really bad week and uh, my tick expectancy goal for that week was greater than three. Um, but it turns out I had a really bad week and my tick expectancy is negative three. Then for the next week, all I want to do is have, I add a quarter of a, a, quarter of a tick. That's it. Uh, uh, well, if it's negative, my, my tick expectancy is I want a positive tick expectancy. And then say it's one that week. That's when I add a quarter of a tick. So for the week after that, I want 1.25 ticks. Okay. And uh, so that's one way. I don't just keep the same goals every week. And so uh, whatever I did wrong the previous week, that's what is my new goal. Um, you know, like, like the one that we, we talked about there, you know, I wasn't able to continue to be aggressive and I got complacent. And that, that was a problem in a, in a, you know, if I'm making money in a trade, I want to I wanna capitalize on it and keep the pressure and uh, and continue to push because my risk my risk is is uh, pretty much mitigated. Okay, uh, let's see here. Ah, okay. Uh, Nicholas is asking about your um, uh, total monthly uh, fixed trading expenses. Um, you mean like uh, how much Inter I pay for data and yeah, uh, internet connections, platform costs, data, etc. Um, probably around 120 bucks. I do like uh, the DTN IQ feed for my data because even though I'm only trading the ES, I want to see uh, several different markets. Um, let's see. I like you know everything that Bookmap has to offer, so I pay the extra 50 bucks a month for that complete package. 
Uh, and I, you know, like I said, I think that's indispensable. And the amount of money that you know that's going to make me just by having it is a big deal. I mean, I, I can't uh, I can't do without those. Um, okay, sounds good. Uh, let's see here. Um, so uh, during the presentation, you're looking primarily at, at Bookmap. Um, are, are you doing that during the day uh, as well? Yes. Uh, I actually, my computer is an all-in-one desktop uh, computer. So the, the screen that has my book map, I need, I, I need that screen to uh, run you know, as, as smoothly as possible. And the other screens are just up for reference. I mean, I want to see the investor RT as we get closer to uh, certain price action points of interest, but I'm focused directly on the BookBap platform for pretty much the whole time. Okay. And then are you um, uh, reviewing and, and uh, uh, providing notations uh, within BookMap, you know, at the same time, or are you just... you? you just do your homework uh, without the notations? Yeah, no, I do the notations on the side on my daily trade log, and I just have it set up in the small corner there that you guys saw at the beginning so that I can just quickly hit the time and my comment and get back to what I was doing because I don't want uh, writing a comment to, to you know keep me from seeing something in the market or something like that. So I just try to make it as quick as possible, and then at the end of the week I'll go through and, you know, print all of that out for the week so that I have something uh, as reference while I'm looking at the charts outside. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, let's see here. Um, uh, just some other questions. That I, I, uh, they're more personal for you, um, but uh, uh, based on, I mean, it's more about your capital, uh, how you are, uh, uh, how much you're putting at risk, um, uh, percentage-wise, um, uh, how much you trade, uh, and then diverting the funds for longer-term uh, investments or, or options plays. Um, uh, I don't know anything about options. Uh, I'd love to. Maybe that's something to look at at a later point in time. Um, but this uh, this is all I'm doing. Um, I'm looking. I'm out at the end of the day. I don't hold anything overnight. Um, as far as what was the, what was the beginning of that? Um, yeah. How much of the the um, the capital base you're oh, using capital. percentage wise? Um, I'm using, I have a daily uh, limit of about 2% of my capital. And uh, I, I only like to risk 1% uh, in any given trade, uh, but I don't even like to do that. Uh, so I like to, you know, I put that first trade on and I want to be able to move my stop as quickly as possible to mitigate that risk because uh, even even if if it starts moving against me and I add on to scale out at my original entry, uh, for example, that that drives me crazy that I'm putting on so much risk. Uh, but it's a it's a necessary part of it, I think, because otherwise it will just go back and stop me out for full one contract instead of having a better uh, entry, really. Okay, and uh, let's see. Well. End up here. Uh, Brian is asking about um, uh, uh, your if you're achieving uh, consistent positive expectations. Is account size the only issue for increased profitability? No, I don't think account size uh, is an issue for increased profitability. Um, you know, I, like I said, I mean, it doesn't matter if I'm trading with a $10,000 account or a $5,000 account. All I need is is one, or I really need two contracts. That's all I need uh, to be able to be profitable. And, um, you know, as long as your risk reward is set up correctly, then you can, uh, Jason Love talked about that yesterday. You could be wrong 20, or you can be right 20% of this time and still be profitable. Um, so uh, I don't think that is uh, taken into account really at all. Right. Okay. 
Okay. Well, uh, I think that's uh, that's it. Uh, thank you very much, Daniel. That was just an excellent uh, presentation. Um, and well, thanks. Uh, lots of lots of good stuff. I, in there. I hope that you know everybody. I hope that you've all been able to find something helpful in here. It wasn't a complete waste of your time. And uh, I, I look forward to collaborating with each of you in the trading community. Uh, and like I said, feel, please feel free to reach out to me, uh, whether it's online or over Twitter or Skype or. You know, you want to get up for beers and sketch on cocktail napkins. I'm always down for conversation, like I said. So uh, if you have any more questions, like I said, man, reach out to me. And uh, thanks again to Bruce and Sahi and everybody at Bookmap for bringing me on. Uh, yeah, lots of thank yous coming in. Uh, so, uh, um, yeah, uh, much appreciated. Thank you very much, Daniel. Cool. My pleasure. Okay. Bye, guys.